So hello everyone. Um, I hope everyone can see the slideshow and also hear my voice. So nice to meet you everyone. My name is Byung Ho Jung and today I'm gonna uh, walk you through the oil statistics um, overview. I'm going to walk you through uh, over the three steps. Uh, first, I'm going to show you the general key oil trends and um, key concepts of the oil statistics. And finally, the key points uh, when reporting oil data. Um, the first slide that I'm showing right now is, is uh, supply side of the oil. And on the left-hand side, we see the two comparison between 1973 and 2021. And even if the overall share of the oil that contributes to the energy supply has been decreased since 1973, uh, we still see that the, it is the, still the largest energy source um, accounting for 29% in 2021. And it is followed by coal and natural gas accounting for 27 and 24 percent, respectively. If we um, see on the left, on the right hand side, there are two tables um, showing the energy uh, oil production landscape between 2016 and 2022. Back in 2016, uh, we see the um, Saudi Arabia and the Russian federations are top oil producers producer at the time. However, since 2017 and continuing on uh, 2022, we see that United States uh, becomes the, the top oil producer. Let's take a look at the refinery, uh, refinery sector. Uh, on the left-hand side, this stacked graph shows the world refinery output by product. Apparently, uh, back in 2020, uh, we see a primary decline in the in the oil demand due to the COVID uh, pandemic crisis. And, and in 2021, based on our data collection last cycle, we see a rebound uh, after um, after a primary decline in 2020. And um, because this graph is showing the um, fuel-wise um, uh, demand data we see that mainly um, motor gasoline and middle distillates, which include gas diesel oil, are the primary source of oil demand in the world. When we look at the right-hand side um, graph, it shows the regional, um, region-wise information. And of course, we see a deep um, decline in 2020. But uh, when it comes to the region, we see that Asia um, shows the the highest growth in the refinery sector. And interestingly, um, it shows the lowest decline in 2020, which means that it had the less least impact by the COVID-19. Again, when we look at the demand side data, um, on the left-hand side, we see that the the oil product demand is mainly driven by Asia. And um, when it comes to the um, sectoral um, consumption data on the right-hand side, we see that um, road and non-energy use are the main source that consumes the oil, um, oil energy. All this information can be found in the Oil Information 2023 publication and World Energy Statistics and Balances publication. Now moving on to the key concepts of the oil products. First, we can classify oil products between primary and secondary oil products. And in between, we have a process called refinery. Um, primary oil products consist of these um, um, products listed here, including crude oil, condensates, natural gas liquids, and the other um, synthetic crude oil, et cetera. Secondary oil products have a, a various um, kinds of the oil products here listed here. 
de detailed uh, specification um, can be found in our oil um, annual oil questionnaire report instruction file or in the IRS guideline. Mm -hmm. And uh, not in, in addition to primary oil products, we have also secondary products inputs uh, that goes to the refinery, such as additives or uh, refinery feedstocks. Here, I just want to touch up on um, one product here, condensates. We have two types of condensates that, uh, that we cover in our annual oil statistics. One is the field, field condensate that is recovered from associated and non-associated gas fields that we just learned from NOAA and NOAA's presentation before. And we regard that as a crude oil. So we report this portion under the crude oil column in the oil um, annual questionnaire. On the other hand, we also have a plant condensate that is recovered from the natural gas processing plants or separation facilities. And in the oil questionnaire, we consider that as a NGL, natural gas liquids. So that is small, um, 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 small um, instruction that I'd like to give you here when we report data in our oil um, annual questionnaire. Uh, further, uh, going further, we can also use several characteristics um, to further classify oil products. The first characteristics can be um, density. So as you all know, uh, most of oil is lighter than water, but there is also um, extra heavy oil that has a higher density than the water. And this specific gravity or density is very, um, very much uh, important information to convert from mass to volume and vice versa. And uh, we have uh, also a um, parameter called um, API to determine the density of oil products. And when it, when it uh, comes to the secondary oil products, we can distinguish uh, those products uh, uh, depending on the density of the uh, secondary oil products. Next indicator that we can use to classify oil products can be sulfur content. Um, sulfur is, is uh, undesirable impurities and we want to um, remove this impurity before uh, it is properly used. So if there is a high sulfur content in the oil, we call it as a sour crude, or if it, there is a lower sulfur content, we call it sweet crude. Um, there are there is a range of sulfur content in the oil um, between like uh, down to 0 0.05 or sometimes to above 5%. And from an average crude oil batter, we want to remove 70 or 80% of sulfur to meet, uh, to meet the product um, specification. Finally, we have uh, um, energy, uh, we can classify based on the energy content. Uh, we can simply call it NCV, net calorific values. And it, it means the heat contained in the product uh, when it's burned. We collect different types of NCV as, as we see on the right-hand side. NCV for production level, NCV for imports and exports. And finally, uh, we can calculate the average NCV using the weighted um, average uh, methodology. Mm -hmm. And um, because, of, because of there are so many um, characteristics, different characteristics between the oil, um, it has a wide range of physical and chemical properties. One example here is, um, is showing, depending on the, the contained sur surfer contents, it has an inherent yield a ratio uh, between light, sweet, and heavy sour crude oil. And one more uh, thing relating to um, this refinery specification is that uh, normally um, we have expected range of the um, yield ratio from uh, from the national refinery plant. So one example is that because we know that uh, reconfiguring a refinery is very expensive and 
uh, we want to expect uh, we expect to see a uh, quite stable um, refinery yield uh, from the country. Here I brought some graphs um, over the over the last um, last decades of a fish um, of one country. For example, um, when we look at this 2011 data, we clearly see that um, there is a high yield of gas diesel oil in one year, which makes us to validate this data by asking queries to the data reporters, to the country focal points, to make sure that this data is indeed correct, maybe due to the maintenance of the refinery, or maybe um, it can be the error, data reporting error. So we need to make sure that this 2011 data is outlier or no. Now, after learning the characteristics of oil products, let's take a look at the oil balance. First, we can have a look at the supply side of the primary oil products. So primary oil products here means that it is produced indigenously, and which means that it can be, uh, it's extracted from the natural resources. When we look at the left-hand side, it shows the wellhead production, and to be reported in our oil balance uh, in the questionnaire, uh, we need to make sure that the data is, um, is based on the marketable status or not. As all the fuels um, um, covered um, before, just like natural gas, we want to report the, the marketable status of oil product in our questionnaire. And um, in our questionnaire, we also have flow calls from other sources that treats the um, portion of oil product that is already um, covered in the another questionnaire. One good example is the biofuel. Let's say biogasoline, because it is first reported as an indigenous production in the renewable questionnaire. And if it is um, blended or intended to blend to the conventional uh, fossil fuel, such as um, non-biogas diesel oil, then uh, that portion is reported under from other sources flow in our oil questionnaire. We have obviously like two trades, export and import. And similar to the gas, uh, we can build and draw stock that uh, is playing a key role to, to make a balance between supply and demand. And um, in the oil section, uh, oil uh, world, we have a petrochemical industry that is um, both the producer and consumer at the same time. And some of the um, some of the products um, that are delivered to the final users can go back to the refinery process again. And for further processing, then we use this flow called backflows. We have a flow called direct use that is meant to report the oil products that doesn't uh, go through the refinery process. It can be directly burned, for example, then this is the um, space that we report that oil products. Products transferred means that um, some of the uh, finished or semi-finished uh, products can be uh, reclassified for further processing. Uh, for example, um, if, uh, if naphtha is imported, but it needs the further processing to uh, upgrade uh, the quantity quality of the oil product, then the NAFTA first is reported under import flow under NAFTA column, and um, it's reported with a negative sign under products transferred, and it appears as the refiner feedstocks in this supply side of the balance table. And it's uh, as it the, the arrow shows, it goes into the refinery plant again for further processing. So we just covered the supply side of the primary oil product. Now let's get down to the uh, supply of the secondary oil products. Uh, on the left-hand side, um, uh, we have a list of the secondary oil products from refinery gas, LPG, 
nafta, bitmin, etc. Um, so we have a refinery gross output. Um, that is the production of the oil products from the refinery plants. And some of them could be used as a refinery fuel to help operate the, uh, the refinery facilities. And inter-product transfers is used to uh, for the reclassification of the oil products. For example, um, kerosene um, can be um, blended with the gas, gas oil in order to meet its winter, um, uh, winter specification. In that case, uh, we report kerosene with the negative sign under inter-product transfers, and that portion will appear with the plus sign under gas oil inter-product transfers flow. There is a general rule uh, when we use this inter-product transfers, which, um, which generally we observe the um, the the light uh, product to the heavier um, heavier one. So, for example, kerosene to gas oil could be the possible option, but there is also not likely option in the red box below, uh, which we don't really um, expect to uh, to see in 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 the reporting. This is the product transfer that I mentioned earlier. As we see here, um, there is um, this portion is discounted from this balance, and this dotted arrow um, leads leads this portion to to go back to the refinery uh, process again. Primer product reads it um, again. Like uh, one good example is the bio gasoline that is blended into the non bio uh, motor uh, motor gasoline. And there could be some recycled products in the country. And um, we also uh, report international marine bunkers here uh, and trade and stock build and stock draw. So since we cover the supply of the oil, uh, primary oil and secondary oil products, it is very key to understand the refinery process. And uh, using the data reported in the oil questionnaire, uh, we, we can have a very important parameter, which is refinery efficiency, to validate if the data is, in a, is a reasonable or not. And um, losses can always occur during the refinery process due to the evaporation. So when the refinery intake is larger than the refinery gross output, we call it as a refinery losses. And vice versa, uh, the other opposite case, we call it refinery gains. And the units matter here because when it comes to the mass and energy units, we, al we always want to see the refinery losses following the fiscal rule. However, when the data is reported in volume units, sometimes we see that um, we see some refinery gains. Um, similar concept is the refinery yield using the um, output and intake of the refi refinery plants. And um, oil balance, in the oil balance, um, we just um, what uh, showed the um, international marine broker consumption. One key message that I want to highlight here is that um, the domestic and international split should be determined on the basis of port of a departure and port of arrival, not the, the flag or ownership of the of the ship. Here, um, we we get down to the final consumption part, and depending on the uh, characteristics and properties of the oil products, it has uh, expected um, economic sectors that consumes the um, uh, corresponding oil products. So um, since um, due to the lack of time, I will just a little bit speed up for the rest of the presentation, which is about key points for reporting annual oil. To report all of these different kinds of oil products in the oil IEA um, annual oil questionnaire, we have a, um, a number of tables. And each table is correlated to each other 
and plus oil questionnaire is again is related to the another fuel questionnaire. And here are some tips um, to um, to ensure the consistency between the questionnaires and tables. First, um, it's about natural gas liquids. So natural gas liquids um, generally consists of ethane, propane, butane, etc. The thing is that the heavier fractions are often uh, further processed in the refinery, but the lighter fractions, fractions are generally used directly. So let's take a look at the first option. What, what about like natural gas liquids processed in the refinery? So we have two tables used here. One is table one, where we report here, example is 100 kiloton of NGL is reported as a indigenous production. And then it goes into the refiner intake. And some, somehow um, this refiner plants convert uh, this NGL into non-biogasoline. So we report in table 2A, the refiner grows output here. Another example, what if the NGL is used directly? And we have a flow called direct use. And um, here, 50 kiloton of NGL is first reported under the indigenous production, and it goes into direct use. We see that there is a zero refiner intake. And this directly used NGL um, can be reported in the another table um, to indicate that it is convert here. In this case, it is transferred to the LPG. So with the minus sign, we indicate minus 50 kiloton of NGL under inter-product transfers and 50, per, 50 kiloton of LPG appears on the right-hand side. And it always have to be zero. Uh, the net inter-product transfers has to be always uh, zero. And that's uh, one of our um, criteria to validate the data. And Next um, tricky reporting issue is the biofuel. And uh, one just one very key important message here is that pure biofuels, pure, should only be reported in the renewable balance. If that biofuel is blended or intended to blend into the conventional fossil fuels, then our oil questionnaire comes into play. So, uh, on the right hand side, that, that is the example of a uh, of, uh, oil questionnaire. And uh, first, we report uh, biofuel portion in table one under receipts from other sources and direct use. And in the another table, uh, we indicate uh, the portion of uh, biofuels um, for, uh, for blending. For this, we have a bonus question in the exercise. So we will treat, uh, we will have a more uh, closer look there. And then finally, uh, we have a petrochemical flows. I mentioned earlier, because that is the both producer and consumer of the oil products, it's really tricky sometimes or more than sometimes to report data here. And we have a specific flow backflows uh, to statistically represent this portion. So on from refinery to gross inland deliveries, some of them are um, used, um, uh, go to the petrochemical industry for energy use or non-energy use. We can distinguish these two portion, these two uh, flows, and there is energy output and non-energy output. And we only follow these energy outputs as a, as a backflows because it contributes to the refinery inputs. Sometimes is this backflow can be directly exported or, or sale. And uh, we have to highlight here that non-energy use output from petrochemical industry is not part of our oil annual oil annual oil questionnaire. Uh, to close up uh, my presentation, here is the slide um, to access to all of our IA publications relating to the energy data. And as mentioned, here are some information uh, for you. Thank you for your attention. It's very uh, <laughs> tight. So I hope you understand well. 
and I welcome any questions that you have. Thank you.